So in this video, we're going to be making this little simple animation here, just a, a floating div. So there's two parts to this. There's the motion of the div, the X and Y in 2D space, and then there's the opacity fading in and fading out. And so there are a lot of external libraries that will do animations for you, but for simple things like this, um, for me anyways, I don't want to, no matter how large or how small the libraries are, these animation libraries, for something simple like this, it's really unnecessary. You can do it with a simple uh, JavaScript, CSS, HTML, and a bit of math. I'll, I'll walk you through the math. The math is not that difficult, but just basic uh, fundamental vanilla default boilerplate tools in order to create a simple little floating div. If this interests you at all, stick around. Let's begin. All right, so before we begin, let's go over what we want to do visually. If you don't care about the explanation, just fast forward. I'll have a timestamp in the description or on the page. But what do we want to have accomplished uh, visually? Well, we want to float an image, and we'll, we're going to be using divs for now, and then we'll convert to images at the end of the video. We want to float an image, a div, from bottom to top. So we want to have something like this. We want it to follow some sort of path from the bottom to the top. Now, if you're not familiar with the mathematical functions, what this kind of looks like and what we're going to use is a sine function. So we're going to use a sine function, and the sine function is just one of, you may have seen it, the Arctic Monkeys had an album with AM where they used their little logo, AM, and they modeled it after a frequency curve. You may have seen it in music or whatever, visuals, vocals. And so this is a sine curve. The properties of a sine curve are that it starts at negative 1, and then it goes to 1, and then it goes to negative 1, and 1, and it oscillates between two values infinitely. So we're going to use the properties of a sine curve to model two things. First, the motion of our little... Uh, floating div, and then the transparency or the opacity of our floating image or floating div. So how should we think about this in terms of motion? Well, in HTML, it positions or lays things out on your screen based on an X and Y coordinate system, a 2D coordinate system, and it uses the top left of a div, of a container, of an image, to position it on the page. So on the on your page, you have an X and Y axis. Let's say we had a point 50-50. We wanted to put a div or an image at 50-50. Well, your HTML would find that point, and then it would put, based on the top left of that container, it would put that image or that div just like that. For this video, this is purely for aesthetics, for I don't know, OCD, whatever you want to call it, we're going to make our HTML position elements based on the center of our uh, of our elements, our, HT, our HTML, or excuse me, our, uh, our div containers, our images. And why are we doing that? Well, if we can use the HTML to place a, an image, a div container on the page, what happens if we take this coordinate, but we tailor this coordinate to a moving X and Y? Well, wherever this X and Y ends up on the, on the function, when we get to the functions, I'll show you. That's where the div is going to be. That's where the image is going to be. So on the default, it would look like something like this. That would be your container there. And in the next frame or the next second, it might be here. And that would be your container. And doing this creates the illusion of movement. Now, why did I, or why are we going to reconfigure so we're, we're aligning our images by the center? It just looks better. And the math kind of just feels better. So wherever the function goes, that's going to be the center of our image. So instead of the top left looking like that, wherever it goes, center of image. Wherever it goes, center of image. So that's going to handle the motion. We're going to use a sine curve. We're going to plug in or substitute the x and y values of an image of a container. We're going to feed off of a function, a flowing value or a floating set of numbers. And wherever those numbers go, that's where the image is going to go. Now, how do we use a sine curve to handle opacity? Well, this is a bit, oh, well, a lot easier. So we have an X and Y here for our sine curve like, like this, but you could visualize it as the sine curve going like that, vertical. For our opacity, we can keep the sine curve horizontal because all we want to do is the sine curve goes from negative 1 to 1. We're going to switch that from 0 to 1. So we're going to have a sine curve going from 0 to 1, 0 to 1, 0 to 1, 0 to 1, infinitely. And because opacity at 0 is completely blank or completely transparent, you can't see the div, and 1 is you can see the div, if we, just like we tailored the x and y values in motion in terms of uh, physical space to a sine curve, when we tailor those opacity or the opacity values to a sine curve, what we're going to get is completely off, we can't see the image, and then completely on, we can see the image. Completely off, we can't see it, see it. Can't see it, see it. 
So in that way, we're going to use a sine curves properties to kind of fade in and fade out, fade in, fade out, fade in, fade out, fade in, fade out an image. So with all that said, let's, uh, let's get to coding. All right, so before we begin, let me just show you the site we're going to be using. It's an online graphing calculator called Desmos. This is just going to help us visualize the sine curves, which is going to be the motion path of our little uh, image. Uh, I know it goes from left to right. That's the natural way these functions work. Just uh, visualize it for our motion that it's going from bottom to up. So this part would be the bottom right here, and then on the right side would be up. So it's floating upwards. See how it's, it's bending back and forth? Just picture that rotated vertically. So that's the Desmos.com. We're just going to use it to help us visualize the path of our object. So before we begin, let's uh, normalize our canvas. This is a completely unnecessary. It's just a force of habit. So we're just going to say margin of zero. We're going to say a padding of zero. And then let's just say a height of 100 viewport height and a width of 100 viewport width. And now let's create the little card or the div container. We'll convert it to an image later. So we'll create a class for that called card. We'll do a width of I don't know, 120 pixels. We'll do a height of 90 pixels. I'll do a background color of red. Now let's put that guy on the screen right here. Scroll just a bit. Let's do a div.card. Save. We'll go to our screen. And that's it. It's too uh, it's too high. Let's do a height of 50. That should look better. All right, that's good. So let's move this guy away from the top left because we float it right now. It's just going to float completely off the page and we're not going to be able to uh, diagnose the, uh, the, uh, the, the mathematics of our curve. So let's do a position absolute. Position absolute. If you know what I'm doing with all this position absolute top left stuff, I'll leave a link in the description below. Left is like your X value. So we do a left of 50%. I'll leave a link in the description below. Top is like your Y value. I'll do 80%. I'll leave a description below of a video I did on position and display. It's pretty, pretty good. Uh, it's a fundamentals of position and display in HTML. It's one of the things that you really need to know as a front end developer. And it just helps you, helps you get the, the, the groundwork going before you do any sort of complicated stuff with the, uh, with realigning or, or or positioning other elements within elements. And so position left top, we'll save. And we got this guy right here. And so like I said in the intro, HTML uses the top left of a container to position elements. So right now this top left, that's 80% from the top and the left, that's 50% from the left. We're going to transform this to get the center to be right here. So all of our math is going to start from the center again in the, the intro I told you this is just for the sake of aesthetics you don't need to do this and so to do that we do a transform we'll do a translate like that and we'll do a negative 50 percent negative 50 percent and all that means is let me save let me format there we go save all that means is when you're doing your little uh your layouts of your elements like this this is the default X and Y. Negative 50% of a transform means negative 50% this way, and the other negative 50% says negative 50% this way. So basically shift this X to here. So all the math, all the coordinates stem from the center, or negative 50, negative 50 of your original HTML element. And the 50% is 50% of width and 50% of height. That's what it's uh, relative to. So we do a save, we go back to our little div, and now this is the negative, or excuse me, the top 80% and left 50%. So we have a little card here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move our, our div, we're going to make it sway, we're going to make it float upwards. And so in physics, if you remember from your high school, in 2D and 3D space, uh, though something may look like it's moving like this, what you can do mathematically is treat the x axes and the y axes uh, independently of one another and so we're going to do that for our little div for our y axis for this floating thing all it's going to do is float straight up so it's going to be a constant value going upwards it's the x value of this that creates the illusion of its swaying not the y value so let's go into the code and code for the y value just transforming or translating excuse me this image just straight upwards to do that we're going to establish some variables let's do this let's capture the card first Let's do a const, we'll do a card one is equal to document dot query selector, and we'll capture the card like that. And let's do this. Let new x, which we're going to use to create a new x for our little, uh, our little image, little card. Let's start at zero, we'll do a new y. And then we're going to need some sort of variable that, that, uh, that moves, that shifts. We're just going to call that, I don't know what we should call it, let's say let animated value. Let's say, I don't know, start at zero for now. Start at zero, and then we need the origin point of this uh, of this image. To do that, we can use a function called 
get computed style. Any sort of CSS that transforms an HTML element, get computed style will get any sort of values associated with that CSS. So what we can do is, let me scroll up. What we could do is const, I'll just call it my center like this, and I'll put it in an object. It's easier to use that way. So the X is going to be get computed style. You feed in the, the element you want to get the style of. So that's the card one. And then you have access to all of the properties of the CSS of that HTML element. We want the left because that's the X. And for the Y, we want the top. So our, uh, and then we get the top like that. And these guys are strings. In order to use them in our math, we need to parse them into floats or integers. We're just going to do floats. So parse float. There we go. Parse float. All right. So we have the center image. We have something to track a new Y or excuse me, a new X, a new Y. And then we have a value that we can animate. We can move so we can actually move through a sine curve. So if you don't know how functions work, it's an f of x sort of situation on the left. You feed in a, a value that's constantly moving and you'll constantly move in terms of y through the curve. So if you if your x is always five, or let me say, what is this? So let's say your x is always pi over two, your y is always gonna be one. But since we're gonna have a moving x value on the x-axis, we're gonna get to the y's of this, 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 and we can move through the curve like that. And so let's hook into an animation frame. Let me spell this right, animated, there we go. All right, so request animation frame. And we're going to feed in a function called start animation. So all request animation frame does is you may remember from your I don't know, grade school days when you would draw, you have a, a booklet, right? And you draw on one page something like that. And then on the next page, you draw something like that. And then you'd flip through the book quickly and it would create the illusion of movement. That's what the request animation frame does. It allows us to hook into each frame of a draw of our screen and then we can paint something on the screen and this creates the illusion of movement. So first the div is here or the image is here and then the image is here and then the image is here and then the image is here. And through doing that, we create the illusion that the image is floating upwards. So that's all request animation frame does. And so we're feeding in a function called start animation. Let's create that function. So function start animation, just like that. And this is where we're going to create or or we're going to uh, calculate new X's and new Y's and then set the X and Y of the div. Now, I'm not going to go into how this works exactly because the video is going to be extremely long, but this is going to be a recursive function. So just a, a function that calls itself. So this is how we're creating a loop of, a, of an animation. Basically, we're flipping through that little book doing this. And so we need to start this function. And once this function does stuff here, it's going to call itself. But in order to start the function, we need to start the function. So I'm just going to add a listener, add event listener, and we'll do a listen for a click of my mouse. When I click on my mouse, it'll start the animation like this, and then this will just loop infinitely. So we'll do a click that. We won't need any sort of event, and we're just simply going to call the function start animation. Now, for the sake of this uh, this video, you don't need to do this, but just for um, troubleshooting purposes. Uh, sometimes your animations get hung up or they speed too quickly and you'll have to restart the browser or refresh the page. I'm just going to have a way to cancel the animation. So I'm just going to listen for a key press, actually a key up. So once I release the A key, then I'm just going to cancel that animation frame, hooking into it. So let's say if event.key is equal to A. And so when you request an animation frame, it gives you a unique ID to that little process. So I'm going to save that. Let's just say animation ID is equal to null for now. Then when we create it, it gives us a little ID back. So animation, animation ID is equal to this. And then when I press the, uh, the A key, we're just going to cancel the animation frame. So feed in that ID. All right. So within our function, we're just going to float it upwards on the Y axis. So the new Y is just going to be, and we're going to have that animated value. So let's just say the origin, did I say origin? I said center. So wherever the center starts, center.y, we're going to subtract. And the reason we're subtracting and not adding is it's a bit counterintuitive, but on your, on your page, the left of your x-axis, the left is negative, right is positive. On your y, it's flipped. So on the top is not positive. Top's negative, bottom's positive. So to float it up, we actually have to minus or subtract y values. So the new y is going to be the center.y where it starts minus that animating value. So animated value, like this animated value. 
Now, on the first frame of this, animate value is zero. We need to increment it after we use it or else it's always gonna stay zero. So we'll just say animated value, that ID animated. There we go. And we'll just do plus plus like this. And new Y, we set the Y of our card. So card, let's get some spacing in there. Card one, that's style. And the top is our Y is equal to, and the unit here is a float. We need pixels for our units for the Y or for the top. So we have to do something like this. We'll do the new Y and it's in pixels. There we go. Do we have everything there? All right, we'll save, we'll go back. I click and we get our Y axes in this sort of 2D physical environment. Now let's animate the X so we get some sort of sway. So I press A, we stop the frame. And so we're gonna tailor our X to this function. So our X is gonna go, and again, it's left to right, but picture it from bottom to top. Our X is gonna sway back and forth like that. So to do that, let's do a new X. So new X is equal to center.x, and we're going to add, we're gonna plus because the X axis goes from negative to positive, from left to right. We're gonna add that these values here. To hook into these values, we need to use this function right here. So sign, so math.sign, and we need a value that's ever changing so we can actually move through the curve. That value that's always changing is the animated value. So we'll put the animated value in here. There we go. And let's do the card one dot style dot left is our X. And again, it's pixels for the, the units, or the function of units. Let's do a new X and PX. There we go. Let's save, let's go back. And I click my mouse, we get this. Now, what's happening? Well, let me stop that. Press A, we stop. All right, so in a normal vanilla sine curve, this goes from, it starts at zero, but the curve oscillates between negative one and positive one, negative one and positive one. On our canvas right here, what is one represented as? Well, it's one pixel. So that's why it's moving like that. It's moving one pixel here, one pixel there, one pixel here, and so we need to elongate the amplitude of our sine curve so that we can have a, a larger sway like this. And we do that by multiplying the entire sine by a number. So pay attention to the uh, the curve on the right. So let me just say, I don't know, 10. Now let me zoom out, it's way too high. So now you see that we're going from zero, we start at zero, we go to 10, negative 10, 10, negative 10. So we're elongating the, the amplitude, what they call the amplitude of the sine curve. And in terms of our motion, that means our path is going to be longer this way. So let's go to the code and do that. I don't know if 10 is going to be the right, right number because 10 pixels is still really small. But let's see what 10 looks like. So we can do that right here. Put some more brackets. So we just multiply the whole sine thing by 10. So 10.0. You don't need the .0. I'm just doing it. Save. We go back. I click my mouse. And we get something that's kind of better. Press A. Let's do 60. Let's see what that looks like. 60 pixels on each side. So oscillate between 60 pixels, pixels, I click, and we get, there we go, something a bit better. We might modify it later. So why is it going so quickly like that? All right, I pressed A, Jesus. All right, so why is it going so quickly? Well, just like we modified, it was going really, sort of really finicky like this, really fine in terms of one, like that. A negative one, one, negative one. It's also the period of the graph. The time it takes to go from one to negative one is really, really short. What we want to do is elongate that so we have something more free flowing. So to do that, we can multiply our X, the inner part of our curve, by a fraction. So a, a number, well, what fraction? A number under one, so between zero and one. Let's do zero point, pay attention to the, uh, reset it. So pay attention to, let me just do 10, because it'll look cooler. All right, so pay attention to the kind of the narrowness of the curve on the right. I'm just going to multiply it by 0 0.5. So 0 0.5, and now let me do 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0. Let's say 0 0.5, 0 0.05. Let me zoom out. So we're just elongating the time it takes to go from the apex, or the you could say the maximum to the minimum, max, min, max, min. Let's go into code and do that. Let's put that in a, a variable. So let's say, let's do, I don't know, let, let's say motion, motion sway, maybe. So we'll do that and we'll just do a 0 0.2. That might be way too, uh, way too large, but we'll see. So we'll just modify this by the, the, what did I say it was? Motion sway. So motion, and again, this animated value right here, 
that's equivalent of our x. So the motion sway is now the 0 0.05, but right now it's 0 0.2. We'll see what value we need. So motion sway times our x, or our animated value, we save, we go back, I click my mouse, and we get something that looks a bit better. Let's do a, I don't know, let's do, all right, so it's achieving, or it's getting to each, uh, each side too quickly. What we want to do is want to slow down the x even further. So let's do 0, 0.0. 0 to, let's try that. Save, go back. There we go. That looks much better. Let's slow it down even more. 0 0.01. Save, go back. All right. Well, that looks, that looks a lot better. So we'll keep it at 0 0.01 for now. So we've done uh, our first thing, our first half of this. Let me press A. Our first half of our little, uh, our little graphic. We've animated the X, or the, excuse me, the Y, which is straight up, a constant. And we can add... We'll do it at the end, but when something floats, it doesn't float perfectly because right now the math is perfect, right? It's a perfect sway here, a perfect sway here, a perfect sway here. Things in nature, organic, they, they're not perfect like that. So we can add an artificial kind of slant. So even though it sways to, to left and right, we can add a, a natural slant to the right. So, so every time it sways left to right, it's still going towards the right. We can do that with something like this. We can just add plus a natural sway and then we'll just do something like this we'll go let natural sway and we'll just say every every frame sway i don't know 0 0.1 in the in the positive direction which is our uh, right side so let's see what that looks like so as you can see it's still swaying back and forth but every time it draws it's going to be if there's a, there's a pull to the right side of our canvas so we'll keep that for now all right, so we have the one half of our little thing done. Let me press A to stop the animation, which is our motion. Let's animate the opacity. So let's get some new variables in here for opacity. All this stuff was for motion. Let's say motion variables. And now let's move on to the opacity variables. So what are we going to need for opacity? Well, like in the intro, I told you we're still going to use a sign graph. And it's going to be a lot easier to understand because we're not going to have to kind of visualize a sign graph going vertical. We can keep it horizontal. Let me reset this guy. So what we want is to tailor our opacity to the sign curve. Let's do that like this. Let's go back here. All right, so we're going to need... Opacity, we're going to have a new opacity. So new opacity, like that. We'll start at 0, 0.0, which is transparent. And then we'll go into here. Let me just key up these guys with, let's just say, uh, modification, motion modifications. Modifications. And then we'll do, we'll do uh, da, 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 opacity mod modifications, like that. All right, so how, how are we going to modify the opacity? All right, so to modify the opacity, let's do this. Just like we started off our motion with the vanilla, the basic, the default sine curve, and it kind of went back and forth really quickly, and then we modified it, let's just hook up the opacity to a default uh, boilerplate vanilla sine curve. So let's do something like new opacity. There we go, is equal to math.sign, and we have a moving value. We'll use the same animated value that allows us to move through the curve. So animated.value, so we have the new opacity, and opacity is between 0 and 1, and it's a number, so we don't have to do this pixel business. We can just say card1.style.opacity is equal to new opacity. We'll save, we go back, and let's do a click of the mouse, see what we get. All right, so why are we flickering on and off like that? Well, for the exact same reason that when we just hooked it up to a basic boilerplate sine curve, we were going back and forth really, really quickly. It's going from negative one to one way too quickly. We need to slow that down. So how do we slow down or how do we elongate a sine curve? We multiply the x, the input, by a number, specifically a fraction. And what type of fraction? A fraction between zero and one. So let's slow it down by uh, 50%. So five, we'll try that might need to go slower. So we can do right here. And we'll put that into a separate variable, just like we put the motion sway into a separate variable. We'll do, uh, let's call it opacity speed. We'll do 0 0.5 like that. So we'll multiply our x, or our animated value, by that opacity speed. And we'll save, we'll go back. I click my mouse. 
way too quickly. Let's slow it down by mm, zero point. Let's go zero point zero one. Let's just see if it zero one. Yeah, zero one. Save. Go back. That looks a lot better. Now our little div is starting at a full opacity. Let's turn that to starting off of the uh, starting on fully transparent, so we can't see it. So it looks much like the end product we want. So opacity. We'll start at zero. And I click my mouse and we fade in and we fade out. Now, we're basically done retooling or tooling or tweaking all these values up to aesthetics. Right now we're fading in really nicely and we can see the image and I'd like to fade out just a bit sooner. All right, so I've gone ahead and cleaned up the code, reconfigured just a bit. I'll show you just to produce an end product that looks like this. The image fades in, we get to see it, and then it fades out, and that's considered one animation cycle. And so the animation ends after that. Now, what did I modify? Well, I took the div away here, and I just substituted with an image from a random image site, pixsum.photos. It's a 200 by 200 image, the exact same class. I modified that class slightly though. No longer are we dictating the width, the height, and the background color. That all comes from the image. I then added the opacity to 0 0.01, not zero. We'll get to that in a second. I added a border radius and a box shadow just in terms of for uh, aesthetics. So it looks a bit nicer. Now, what did I do with that opacity? Why is it 0 0.01? Well, I took away that math.absolute on our new opacity. We originally had it, I took it away. So on our function here, we now go past zero. And so I use the fact that we can go past zero to terminate the cycle of animation. So our, you could say, because our animation is kind of tracking with the motion, we're starting at zero, well, technically 0 0.01, and we're fading in, fading in, fading in, we're fading out, fading out, fading out. And this is when we should stop the opacity and stop the motion. So I've coded that here. As soon as the opacity goes below zero, we know that it's faded out. We know that we saw it go back and forth and we want to stop the animation. So I just did a, did a simple return. Until that point, we're just going to keep requesting that those animation frames. We're going to keep the loop going. So that's how I created this, the, uh, the effect of fade in, Opacity is now 1, opacity is tracking towards 0, opacity is less than 0, motion and opacity cease to exist. And so that's going to be it for the video. If this helped you at all, if you found it interesting, don't forget to give a like, subscribe if you haven't already subscribed, and I'll see you guys in the next video.